Good morning friends. My name is Tanvir Ajse and today in this module we'll be talking about modern Indian sculpture and some of the very prominent sculptors of modern India who contributed towards the arts practice of sculpture in India in the modern era and we'll also look into their lives at their styles inspirations in short in this module we shall discuss the development of Indian sculpture in 19th and 20th century and learn about the major sculptors of India who contributed immensely towards the making of modern Indian sculpture as we all know India has had a long and rich tradition of art, especially sculpture. This refined historical tradition reflects the cultural and artistic development of Indian art throughout the history. Predominantly, sculpture in the history of uh, in the predominantly sculpture has remained at the forefront of the artistic productions throughout the history under various rulers in various civilizations. We all know that India has had a long and rich tradition of sculpture. This refined historical tradition reflects the cultural and artistic development of Indian art throughout the history. Predominantly sculpture has been at the forefront of artistic expressions of India. Although the major studies on Indian sculpture were conducted by European academicians and scholars who saw the rich tradition of Indian art from that of the European perspective of aesthetics and history. But certain scholars like A.K. Kumaraswamy and Stella Kramrich, followed by a new generation of scholars, approached Indian arts on its own terms and convincingly argued that the Indian art is an expression of creative genius, sculpture in particular. The development of Indian sculpture, if we trace it historically and come to the 19th and 20th centuries, passed through many phases. And to point here and to note and to note at this point all these faces were not monotonous they were not homogeneous but it was a culmination of various things that made progression in the history of Indian sculpture before it came at the doors of 19th and 20th century the sculptors of various generations and regions contributed to the evolution of modern language by constant struggle with the tradition and inspirations in order to arrive at an Indian modern language of art. As we saw in the previous modules where we talked about the schools of art in India and how were they established by the British and what preceded those schools when the British established their empire immediately after the fall of Mughal Empire in India. With the motivations to establish the academic European style of painting and art, Europeans believed in teaching and training new artists, new generation of Indian artists in the Western idiom of art, the Western aesthetics, the Western values, the Western notions of anatomy, the Western beliefs that art should be this and not that. We also saw that how this westernization of Indian art saw a very serious rebuttal 
when the call for revivalism was shouted from Bengal, followed by the artists who even rejected the revival mode and tried to make sense of modernity in general in their own respective ways and create art which is more representative of the Indian society of the current or the contemporary Indian society of 1930 and 19th century or the contemporary Indian society of 19th and 20th century. We saw how the establishment of major art schools across India developed not just one linear language of sculpture, but various idioms that propagated the idea of art in India. By 1930s, Indian sculptors started to create or achieve individual style with experiments of different mediums. They experimented with metal casts, they experimented with clay, they experimented with plaster of Paris. We'll talk about it later on in this lecture when we come to the individual choices of the material and then how artists saw their own styles in tandem with the materials they were experimenting with. By the time many artists traveled abroad for further study and observed new ideas and basis of Western art and its development. And this becomes very crucial in Indian art history pertaining to the idea of modern in India. That when certain artists, as we'll see, went to Europe to study the art and came back to practice in India, the culmination, the culmination of these two styles or the blend of Indian style with the Western style emerged in the form of a new vocabulary or a new language for the creative expression. The excess of Western world for inspiration resulted into the experiments with materials as we talk about, methods, concepts, and therefore became diverse exercises. This transition, or if we call it departure, from the academic art introduced, because with the academic art, there was a limitation of the material that if you have to carve a refined, fine statue, you could either go with marble or with bronze or any other metal that could give you convincing results. And we need to also note here that your essential patrons during this period were British and who have been instrumental in propagating the Western uh, ideas of art and anatomy, how a figure could be depicted, how a gesture should be made. Therefore, the modern, the blend of the Western and the Indian and the introduction of new materials uh, and revived Indian sculptors' interest in the folk and tribal arts became a precursor for the experimentation because it provided a lot of scope so the sculpture, instead of confining it to a few materials, opened itself up for the experimentation and the possibility of materials in which an artist could give expression to his imagination. During the 1940s and 50s, modern Indian sculpture, if we see, adopted unique indigenous language with distinct style and subjects of representation. Now, when we referred to the folk and the tribal art forms previously, it had its roots in revivalism and indigenism. It had its roots in the rich folklore and traditional artistic practices in India. 
that span across from folk to tribal when artists actually started looking at a convincingly indian but not at the same time devoid of modern tag of it vocabulary which could represent india on the international art scene sculptors their practice and their profound artistic imagination which we'll discuss in this module would give holistic idea of the development of modern sculpture in india now as i said in the beginning that most of the monumental works scholarly work that has been done on indian art and especially on indian sculpture has been done by the western scholars so we need to keep in mind that when we are talking about the indian sculptural tradition the sensibility of art that has come to us in the wrap of modernity needs to be critically scrutinized before it is accepted and endorsed because the notions of art that perpetuated in europe in 19th and 20th century and to note more the notions of academic realism that perpetuated in england great britain in spite of the other parts of the europe especially the france italy and other countries spain embracing the modernity and coming up with new idioms and expressions of our dispensing with the academic realism in india the british prevalence meant that you still have to continue with the academic art so therefore the studies that essentially took place during the british rule in india were ridden with problems of research of scholarship of sources that needs to be scrutinized properly scholastically in order to distill what the sculptural or the artistic practice of india historically was what it is progression meant how did the sculptural history or the sculpture as an art form develop throughout the ages what were the pinnacles and what were the downfalls of the history in terms of the artistic practitioner the uh, practitioners in terms of the artistic practice and at the same time one needs to look at the history of patronage under which the artistic expression flourished as we saw in the previous modules and as i have been repeatedly insisting upon the fact that india doesn't need to be seen as a monolithic homogenous country with one particular artistic idiom that flourished in one time there were always constant parallels there were always it was in constant flux if to call it the sculptural tradition alongside other folk and tribal artistic practices have been in constant flux throughout the history we have already learned a lot about it in the previous modules so i will not waste more time on uh, describing again what i have already and uh, i have already told you in the previous modules let's focus on some of the sculptors of the 19th and 20th century in india and talk about their artistic practices and how they shaped their sensibilities and the sensibilities of their followers with their practice the first in the list is ganpat rao matre from 1876 to 1947 He is an important Indian sculptor of Bombay school in the history of academic realism in India. Matre initially enrolled to be a painter but became one of the major academic sculptors of his times. According to Durandar, Matre was a gifted student and he had seen him working on a semi-life size plaster figure though he was a young painting student. He surprised that time principal of the JJ School of Art Greenwood by his sculpture of a young Maharashtrian lady on her way to the temple because it was 
produced without any help from his teachers. The sculpture to the temple won him the Bombay Art Society Medal in 1896. Matre's achievements convinced the English art academicians of the time the Indian ability to grasp Greco-Roman sculpture and its techniques fluently. Greenwood admitted that, and I quote, there is no one here who can practically teach him anything more in that direction. And therefore, he wanted to send him abroad, for which to appeal for the patronage of British art lovers, Greenwood sent the details of Matre to the Magazine of Art in London to show the development of sculpture in India. His sculpture later on Saraswati in 1900 was sent to the Universal Exposition in Paris, which was described as a symbolic depiction of Saraswati by a French critic. In various exhibitions, Matre's works were compared with the great sculptors of Europe and America. He continued his practice by establishing a foundry and commissions from the princely states like Gwalior, Kolhapur and Mysore came his way. The legacy of Bombay's academic sculpture tradition continued in 1920s by the rise of professional sculptors such as Shama Rao Matre, B.V. Talim, V.P. Karmakar, and so on. Talim was known to depict narratives in academic realism. In his sculpture of an Indian ascetic, playing a musical instrument, one can notice the anatomical accuracy with the blissful expression. V.P. Karmakar from 19... From, uh, V. P. Karmakar, another sculptor from 1891 to 1966, born in a family of Ganapati modelers, initially joined Bombay School, moved to Royal Academy of Art London in 1920s. He returned to India after three years. He was fascinated by Art Deco sculptures. In 1925, on his return to Bombay, he made his mark among Maharashtrian nationalists by over life-size sculpture of Shatrapati Shivaji. Soon he became known for public commissions of heroic figures in bronze, plaster and cement. Before Ram Kinkar badge, it should be noted he used cement as a medium but not as radically as Ram Kinkar did in 1940s. Another important sculptor, other than the Bombay School of Sculptors, namely Fanindranath Bose, from 1888 to 1926, is a very important sculptor of early 20th century from Bengal. Bose initially joined Jubilee Art Academy, the private institution, for a short period of time and later on went to Calcutta Art School. After unable to get enrolled at the Royal College of Art London, he went to Board of Manufacturers School of Art at Edinburgh. Inspired by Roda, he became a part of the new sculpture movement in Britain. He settled in Edinburgh and started a sculpture studio. Bose became a part of the major exhibitions including Royal Academy with his significant works. In 1914, he was invited by Maharaja Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda to produce sculptures for Lakshmi Vilas Palace and Baroda Museum. In 1924, he was invited again to teach at Baroda College. His handling of bronze casting and representation of Indian subjects reveals his academic skills and the grasp and profoundity with which he handled the material. 
he was selected to be honored at the 50th anniversary of Sayaji Rao Gaikwad's accession. His successful career, though very short one, ended after a brief illness at the age of 37. In the beginning of 20th century, Devi Prasad Rai Chaudhary, also known as D.P. Rai Chaudhary, from 1899 to 1975, an apprentice of Abhinandar Tagore, emerged as a sculptor depicting Indian life. In 1927, when D.P. Rai Chaudhary became principal of the government school of arts and crafts, he developed influential sculptural style of his own. The Bengal influence affected the art scene in Madras profoundly through D.P. Rai Chaudhary. He significantly contributed to Madras art scene by framing new ideologies to promote secular and humanistic expression against the religious art. The monumental expressive sculpture, Triumph of Labour, represents this ideology of humanistic expressions by showing emotional and physical strength. On the same path, he produced some images of mother and starving infant of Bengal famine in 1943. Devi Prasad believed in humanity as the idea of social justice. On this theme in 1930s, he produced his first figurative relief, the Travancore Temple Entry Proclamation to mark the admission of untouchables in the temples in South India by showing the expression of fear and hope. He taught for 30 years in Madras and inspired generations of artists in South India. Breaking away with the tradition of academic realism and the tag of professional sculptors, Ram Kinkar Baj, one of the most revolutionary artists of modern India, from 1906 to 80, did not show any enthusiasm for Far Eastern art, though he began painting under Nandalal Bose in 1950s. Nandalal noticed the unusual modeling talents in him and transferred him to the sculpture classes immediately. He had enough exposure of modern Western art through Stella Kremlich, who was at that time teaching art history at the Shantiniket. Rodan's expressive roughness of sculptural surface was already accepted and known in Bengal. Because Bengal at that point of time in the history was a cosmopolitan center for art. With the inception of Shantiniketan, and Kala Bhavan as an important center for artistic practices, indigenous, a battery of Indian as well as foreign scholars and artists had inhabited the space and filled it with their creative endeavors and energies. Besides Rodan's surface, Indian sculptures carved in the stone also inspired Ramkinka to choose unconventional material like cement to get textured surface. Well, there was certain other reason to it to which we'll come to uh, later on. But there was another reason to it. His choice of materials such as cement and concrete also corresponds to the roughness of the life of Santals with the representation of stretched legs, gestures, arms, movements of body, etc. Ram Kinger very humbly on the use of his material stated that he chose cement because he simply couldn't afford the bronze. He developed a radical working method and showed interest in the structural quality of sculpture. He used to construct iron armatures for figures covering it by aiming chunks of cement at them and finally shaping the figures by chiseling. That was an unusual method which was solely his own invention. 
For Ram Kinkar, it was not just a technique, but essential part of expression for his subject matter. His works served as independent objects in the outdoor settings of Shantiniketan and thus created harmony between nature and art. The works of Ram Kinkar can be taken as the opening of a new era in the history of modern sculpture in India. Other creative sculptures after Ram Kinkar Badge were N.G. Pansare, 1910-1968, and Andaj Bhagat. Pansare was influenced by the frontality and monumentality of the Egyptian sculptures. He is known for his monumental relief done for the Bombay business houses, such as the New India Assurance Building. One can observe in his creative genius and simplicity of his forms and grandeur of his sculptures, mingling with the monumentality of architecture. Few young contemporaries such as B.C. Sanya, Shanko Chaudhary, Chintamani Ka, Dhanraj Bhagat, Amarnath Sagal, etc. chose to dispense and move away from the conventional art practice. Many of them travelled abroad for further study and observed new ideas and bases of Western modern art and its development in India. Bhagat was among the few who were fascinated by the simplicity and the naive quality of Negro sculptures and various crafts and other media such as cement, paper mache, metal casting, wood carving, stone and welded metals. Like any other artist of his previous generation, he started work in realistic form, but gradually he simplified the forms towards a geometry like cubists. In 1951, Bhagat travelled to Europe and USA where he was impressed by Russian-American sculptor Alexander Archipenko and British sculptor Lynn Chadwick. Inspired by them, he developed his cubist. Inspired by them, he developed his cubistic approach using variety of medium and material in his works. One could see in his works the importance given to the structural quality with geometrical abstract quality, which was inspired by organic forms such as plants, flowers, trees, etc. His compositions gave his sculptures a rare quality characterized by architectural structures. While talking about creative sculptures and individual style, at this point it may be worthwhile to discuss the art and life of Shanko Chaudhary, 1916-2006, whose arts practice combined the ideas of tradition and modernity and propagated a new idiom for the vocabulary of Indian sculptural art. Chaudhary joined Faculty of Fine Arts, the MS University of Baroda in 1950s. Inspired by Henry Moore for his sculptural development, he insisted and introduced fundamentals of art as revealed by Moore and Brancusi while teaching sculpture in Baroda. He explored various materials to represent forms and expressions. He oversimplified forms to produce symbolic and expressive sculptures by dynamic volume and lyricism. He creatively and masterly employed the technique of removing the volume to achieve a particular form in his sculptures. Interestingly, all these qualities of creating convex and concave surfaces are found in his carved and metal sculptures. 
A. M. Devirwala 1922-1975 and Pillo Puchkanwala 1923-1986 worked by maintaining the solid character of blocks. Usually, they selected the block and replaced it in the suitable orientation to create the desired form. Like Chaudhry, Henry Moore was a major influence as he revived the carving as a distinct way of creating sculptures from modeling. Devirwala's uh, sculptures suggest the universal loneliness of man that gave the monumental quality to his sculptures for the particular scale. During 1960s and 70s, Puchkanwala tried almost all techniques and approaches such as carving, metal casting, cement, welding, etc. She also made, a sub, she also made several public sculptures and later moved towards free and unstructured forms. But the technique and material always remained significant elements of her experimentation. Amarnath Sagal, a Delhi-based sculptor from 1922 to 2007, was one of the pioneers of metal sculptures in the Expressionist style. Use of material, technique and expression or the body and soul of his work. During mid-50s, he moved by the complication of human life. During mid-50s, he was moved by the complications of human life and their sufferings and responded strongly against the negative facets of society. Most of his works in this period are based on social themes and executed on the theme of victims of political brutality. Uprisings of cries, unheard, aggression, submission, anguished cries and the tortured are the few examples of his works on such themes which have expressive forms, masses and contours. Sangal's aesthetics effectively connected connoisseurs and his thought which he believed is important to the mankind. Interestingly, patterns of light and shadow produce dynamism in his sculpture. One of his sculptures, Passage of Time, made in 1992, was based on the idea of how the movement of light can create a work of art. It was displayed with the light and sound conveying the idea of Passage of Time. Tradition-based aesthetics can be observed in the works of Lydia Mehta, 1923. Her art practice was very close to Indian approach of art. She achieved mastery in the pottery and ceramics. With the help of such, with the help of such skills, she extended her approach to the form and content through her ceramics. The quality of her Brazilian and stoneware is very similar and seems to be influenced by the classical Japanese and Chinese ceramics. Matha's works are creatively thoughtful that establish links between the consciousness and the self, especially in her body and soul series. Thank you.